Here is 1967 and both the big screen and small screen are jam-packed with super spy James Bond clones. Seemingly everyone's in on it, even Fred Flintstone became a spy in A Man Called Flintstone. This was peak Bond mania, which reached its zenith when Columbia Pictures, who managed to buy the rights for Ian Fleming's Casino Royale, put out their own James Bond satire, which, unlike the others, was actually able to use some of the elements from the books, thanks to a tricky rights situation that would take 30 plus years to clean up. The resulting film was a hit, but it had a disastrous effect on the Bond franchise in more ways than one. Not only would it take until the release of Skyfall in 2012 for the Bond franchise to once again hit the stratospheric heights of Thunderball, but behind the scenes drama would thoroughly alienate star Sean Connery, who was fond of telling everyone that the next film, You Only Live Twice, would indeed be his last. But first, some background on the book. You Only Live Twice as a novel was almost completely ditched by the screenwriters. On the page, the book is a direct sequel to On Her Majesty's Secret Service, which would be the next James Bond film, and much of it revolved around Bond trying to get revenge for the death of his wife Tracy. Thus, the filmmakers hired none other than Roald Dahl, yeah that's right, Roald Dahl of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, to come up with a new premise, which he decided would be a bigger budget redux of Dr. No's plan to steal American rockets with Spectre hijacking both American and Russian rockets in the hope of kicking off World War III. They do it from a hollowed out volcano in Japan, and this would be the first time we'd ever get a look at Blofeld, who would be memorably played by Donald Pleasance. In some ways, You Only Live Twice is remembered by many as the prototypical Bond film, as so many elements of it were parodied in Austin Powers, from the volcanic base to Dr. Evil's look, which is totally patterned on Pleasance from the bald head to the scar to the narrow jacket and the pussycat. Yet, it was not a pleasant shoot. Connery at the time was totally burnt out on Bond. It didn't help that co-stars Bernard Lee and Lois Maxwell had opted to appear in a Euro spy Bond clone, Operation Kid Brother, which starred his brother Neil, a plasterer from Scotland. He was pissed. You have betrayed me, he said. Although eventually, he forgave them after he learned that the two of them made more money from that one crappy flick than all of their Eon films put together. Connery, whatever his faults, always respected the bottom line. He was a businessman through and through. Worse was the fact that they were shooting in Japan and the media and fans never gave him a moment's peace. They were apparently waiting for him after he got off the plane to Japan, criticizing him for not wearing his hairpiece, asking, is this the way James Bond looks? His answer, no, but it's the way Sean Connery does. A media firestorm started when it was incorrectly reported in a bad translation that he didn't find Japanese women sexy, a big faux pas that, it turns out, Connery was actually innocent of. The shoot was a disaster despite having prestigious director Louis Gilbert then coming off of Alfie directing his first James Bond film. Connery even refused to act if either Abadar Broccoli or Harry Saltzman were on the set and he openly told the media that this would be his last James Bond film. Sure enough, Connery gives his most listless performance as Bond. He looks tired throughout and slightly out of shape and paunchy, although there are still some classic Bond moments. The film itself is silly but fun. Dahl is no Richard Maybaum, that's for sure, but the everything but the kitchen sink approach kinda works, and as a travelogue of Japan, it's pretty nifty, although the hook of Bond going undercover as Japanese is incredibly silly. I'd give the screenplay about a 5 on 10, but that said, it has ninjas and the action is really kick ass. I especially like Japanese action star Chitsuro Tamba as the Japanese M, Tiger Tanaka, with him getting in on the action in the insane and iconic ending where ninjas drop into the volcanic base to do battle with Spectre, which of course you'll remember stands for Special Executive for Counterintelligence, Terrorism, Revenge, and Extortion. The movie does, however, feature a chilling and to my mind the best portrayal of Ernst Stavro Blofeld to date, with an unblinking Donald Pleasance in the part. Oh, that's right, he never blinks once. Funny enough, he wasn't originally cast in the part with grandfatherly Jan Werrick, the original choice. Too bad he only has about 10 minutes of screen time and his henchmen aren't all that great. I do kinda like Karen Dar as the femme fatale Helga Brandt, but she seems like a clone of Luciana Paluzzi's Fiona Volpe. I give the villains about a seven on 10. The Bond girls in this one are also a mixed bag. I really like Akiko Wayabayashi as Aki, but she's killed off in an admittedly great scene before the third act, at which point Mihama's kissy Suzuki enters the fray and gets virtually nothing to do but swim around. 
trivia, Connery's wife at the time, Diane Salento, who was a pretty well-known actress in her own right, was her swimming double. The girls are only a six because it's clear the screenwriter had no idea what to do with them. Luckily, the score absolutely kicks ass with John Barry's exotic score meshing well with the badass action themes. I also really like Nancy Sinatra's title song. You which would later be sampled by Robbie Williams for Millennium. Millennium. I give it a 10 on 10. Gadgets are also a 10 on 10 for me. There are so many cool ones here with Desmond Llewellyn's Q bringing a portable helicopter, Little Nelly, to Japan. Tiger Tanaka also has some really good ones, including my favorite, a cigarette gun. Very neat. It can save your life, this cigarette. You sound like a commercial. <laughs> There's also some great one-liners, with my favorite being after a cool fight scene between Bond and Blofeld's bodyguard, Hans. Bon appetit. Again, the action in this film is positively epic, despite the fact that Peter Hunt sat out much of the film with him resenting the fact that he wasn't given the chance to direct. Lewis Gilbert's usual editor, Thel McConnell, does a great job instead, although Hunt apparently returned at the 11th hour to recut the film. Bond kills 18 people on this one, although the ninjas apparently take out more than 70 Spectre killers in the volcano finale. While critics have maligned You Only Live Twice over the years, the film was relatively well received when it came out, although it grossed about 20 million less than Thunderball did in the US and didn't break $100 million worldwide. Although keep in mind, of course, this is 1967, so the film was still a huge hit, just not in comparison to the last one. Yet, James Bond would soon meet his match when Connery vacated the role and a worldwide search began for the next James Bond, which we'll get to next time here on James Bond Revisited on Her Majesty's Secret Service.